Dear brother, I received with warmth your letter of February 5th with your wishes for the mending of my cough. I pray this letter finds one receiving it in a far better state than that of its sender. Sadly, my recovery is gravely lacking. An elusive spirit it seems I can but long for. For this reason, I write you, my beloved brother whom I trust most dearly. The doctors in England advise that the island of Barbados offers promise and has exemplary physicians and urge me to make the journey. I will be eternally grateful, dear sir, if you will accompany me to the island. Your affectionate brother, Lawrence Washington. such wailing since the Battle of Cartagena. <laughs> Take care of him, George. I fear he weakens every day. Such worries of your husband are unwarranted. Lord Fairfax swears a salubrious cure hangs on the island's very breezes. Godspeed, then. Godspeed. You know, it's surprising that up until recently, historians have not grasped the significance of the influences that a visit to an island like Barbados would have on an unsophisticated country boy like George Washington. The first historian to really pay attention to this period of his life is the American historian Jack Warren. I'm a scholar actually of Washington's later life, Washington's presidency, but I wanted to understand what Washington had been through as a young man, what his formative experiences were that had shaped the man that he became. We like to say here that uh, the world opened up like an oyster for George Washington here. Um, he not only slept here, he woke up here. Before George Washington came to Barbados, he was a civilian, embarking on a career as a land surveyor. As a member of Lord Thomas Fairfax's team of land surveyors, he'd scouted property for the prominent Virginian, rode the length of the Shenandoah Valley trekked for weeks down the wilderness of pathless woods and slept under the night sky. He had accumulated acres of land, some status in the eyes of his immediate circle, and sent something lacking in his life. Though he was moving towards the financial security that had eluded the family since the death of his father, Augustine, the genteel status he craved that he saw reflected in the lives of his neighbors, Virginia's powerful Fairfax family, continued to escape him. George's half-brother, Lawrence, was the second son of Augustine Washington's first wife. After the death of their firstborn, Lawrence had inherited all the advantages and expectations befitting an eldest son. Augustine sent Lawrence to a British boarding school where he studied the classics with the aristocratic families of Leicestershire and neighboring counties. But the family fortunes changed a few years later. With the sudden death of Augustine when George was 11, similar plans for George's schooling faded away. At the time uh, Washington would have been sent to school in England, Augustine was, had already been dead for some years. Um, there, there was very little money in the family to support his tuition abroad. Um, 
the, uh, there are many legends about his schooling in Fredericksburg and by a, a convict tutor, but in fact, we know virtually nothing about his early education. What we do know is Washington worked hard to compensate for the gaps in his education. At 12, he copied out by hand the rules of civility and decent behavior in company and in conversation, a book of 110 maxims designed to impart good manners in men of good breeding. Rule 105, be not angry at table whatever happens, and if you have reason to be so, show it not, especially if there be strangers. In the years since their father's death, Lawrence's marriage to Anne Fairfax of the powerful Virginia Fairfax clan, combined with George's natural business sense, had secured the Washington finances. But money without gentility still resigned George to a limited life. Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin had the drawing rooms of Europe. Washington had nothing but the backwoods of Virginia, until a chance journey offered him a new start an opportunity to make connections he couldn't in Virginia. In Barbados, his eminent host, Major Gedney Clark, an in-law of the Fairfax family, would ensure George had access to a level of colonial society unlike anything he had seen. But would the lessons in gentility he had taught himself hold up to the scrutiny of high society Barbados? He would soon find out. The Washington brothers' ship, the success, would have taken about six weeks to get to the island on a nonstop voyage. But George was certainly absorbed by everything going on around him on that voyage. You know, even at 19, you can see the inquiring, intelligent mind of the man, because he decided to keep a ship's log that paralleled the captain's log, and he did so for the entire voyage. Remarks for Friday, 25th. Moderate but contrary winds south-southwest to south-southeast at 9 p.m. Saw many fish swimming about us, of which a dolphin we catched at noon. A constant succession of hard winds, squalls of rain, and calms was the remarkable attendance of this day. This is a cosmopolitan city, a city um, which is the center of trade, Atlantic trade, um, center of commerce for the Atlantic um, trade between England and the Caribbean. Um, in addition to that, you, you find that um, it is also a center for shipping. You're talking about some, some days you might find as many as 300 ships in the British Town Harbor. And in addition to that, you also um, find a city that is a center for information and communications. On July the 5th, 1628, 64 settlers arrived in the 
Bay surrounded by mangroves, which was subsequently named Carlisle Bay after James Hay, the Earl of Carlisle, who sponsored the settlement. Slowly, bit by bit, houses grew up as the mangroves were cleared and a settlement was born. And this was the Port of Bridgetown. To service what we historians call the Atlantic system, which within the British commercial scheme of things required ports to control commerce, three main ports sprang up. London, the home port, Boston in the British North American colonies, and Bridgetown in Barbados. And Bridgetown was one of the key ports of the 17th and 18th century. The first order of the day for the Washingtons in the big city was, unexpectedly, to find room and board. Mr. Washington, sirs, I have regrettable news. Captain Clark's household has been attacked violently by the smallpox. He's asked me to make alternate arrangements for your lodgings. 